The Unbelievable Life and Sad Ending of Gene Crane when thinking of some of 20th Century Fox's greatest stars, one will surely recall Jean Crane and the many film roles she carried out when under contract there. Though not a singer, she was featured in many musical films, among several other genres. Crane was born and raised in California, and grew up relatively close to the studio where she would one day work. Jean Elizabeth Crane was born on May 25, 1925 in Barstow, California, to high school English teacher George A. Crane and Loretta Carr. Though born in Barstow, the family would relocate to Inglewood, California. George and Loretta divorced in 1934, leading Jean and her mother to move to a new residence in Los Angeles. Jean attended Inglewood High School, where she was active in the Girls' League, senior play class, and in various theatrical productions. She was also crowned grid queen. Additionally, one of Jean S. hobbies included ice skating, which garnered her some attention. She was crowned Miss Pan Pacific at the Pan Pacific Auditorium in Los Angeles. Jean Crane was first discovered by Orson Welles, while she was touring RKO Studios with her high school class. Welles, who at the time was casting his film The Magnificent Ambersons, 1942, had the 15-year-old tested for the role of Lucy but seeing the results felt that she was too immature and did not project well on the screen. Crane, intent on an acting career since her first role in an eighth-grade play, went on to win a number of beauty contests. She was on her way to a successful modeling career, when Hollywood beckoned once again. Crane made her film debut adorning a swimming pool in the 20th Century Fox musical The Gang's All Here, 1943, starring Alice Faye and Carmen Miranda. She landed her first major role in the racing story Home in Indiana, 1944, with Walter Brennan and another studio hopeful, June Hever. Of her early films, however, Crane is probably best remembered for her starring role in the remake of the musical State Fair. 1945. Variety called her a perfect foil for Technicolor and also remarked on her excellent voice, perhaps unaware that her singing was dubbed by Luann Hogan. On the strength of her performance, she was named a star of tomorrow by Motion Picture Herald and given a new, more lucrative, Fox contract. Crane's marriage in 1945 to actor Paul Frederick Brinkman who would later leave the profession to become a furniture manufacturer, had a great impact on her career. Over the course of the next 18 years, she would give birth to seven children, often losing plum roles to pregnancy or family responsibilities. Devoted to motherhood, she once said, you have to decide which is more important to you, an armful of babies or a scrapbook full of screen credits. In 1956, Crane was separated temporarily from her husband. There were rumors of other women, but the two reunited on the eve of their 11th anniversary. She credited their strong Catholic faith as the reason the marriage survived. Crane's popularity rose considerably in 1946, with the release of Margie, a sentimental story about the loves of a young high school girl that earned her a Life magazine cover. By now, Crane was receiving over 2,000 fan letters a week, second only at the time to Betty Grable, but she took the next year off to have her first child, forcing the cancellation of a proposed film. After excellent notices as William Holden's wife in Apartment for Peggy, 1948, she was again forced out of several projects due to Preg Nancy. She made three films in 1949, A Letter to Three Wives, The Fan, and Pinky the last of which won her the only Academy Award nomination of her career and gave her some credibility as an actress. The film, which co-starred heavy hitters Ethel Waters and Ethel Barrymore, dealt with the subject of racial intolerance, telling the story of a light-skinned black nurse, Crane, who passes for white in the North, then returns to her southern black roots. Crane had written Daryl Zanuck asking for the role and tested for the part just two weeks after her second child was born. Although many southern cities refused to show the controversial film, it was a landmark movie in its treatment of a contemporary issue. 
The role made Jean Crane the number one box office earner of 1949 and secured for her another four-year contract with Fox. What the studio offered, however, were films featuring sweet young girl roles, including Cheaper by the Dozen, 1950, the biopic on Lillian Mahler Gilbreth, and Ill Get By, 1950. Perhaps the most noteworthy of Crane's films of this period was the George Cukor directed comedy The Model and the Marriage Broker, 1951. Though Thelma Ritter, as a lonely heart's advisor, ran away with the laughs. By 1953, Crane had wearied of the image Fox had created for her, and, after losing the leads in Quo Vadis and Carrie, she finally broke with the studio, commenting, I've been cute long enough. I can't take a chance of being forced to play somebody's daughter again. I am not another Mae West, but then I am not the washed face pigtail type people think I am either. Hiring a new publicist. Crane also dyed her hair red, in hopes of winning sexier roles. After Duel in the Jungle, 1954, for Warner Brothers, she signed a five-year contract with Universal, which specified that she appear in one movie a year. Her first venture with the new studio was The Western Man Without a Star, 1955, in which she played an unscrupulous rancher, a role the New York Times found her a bit too haughty and polished for. She was more successful in promoting her new image in Gentleman Mary Brunettes, 1955, co-starring Jane Russell, and prompting William Zinser of the New York Herald Tribune to remark, she has been hiding her light under a pinafore far too long. She turns out to be a fine song and dance girl from head to toe. Crane's last film for Universal was the courtroom melodrama The Tattered Dress, 1957. The studio ended her contract because she had been unable to report for a film due to the birth of her fifth child. She later sued for back pay. She was off the screen for three years, during which time she appeared in a television production of Meet Me in St. Louis and also made an unsuccessful pilot for The Gene Crane Show, which cast her as an ex-New York model and mother of two, married to a magazine editor. Her return to films included a Western and three undistinguished pictures in Europe, before she returned to the United States to appear in the low-budget 20 Plus 2, 1961, and Madison Avenue. 1962, which had potential as an expose of the advertising industry but was not favorably received. One of her last feature films was Hot Rods to Hell, 1967. Crane busied herself with other interests, mainly painting and sculpting, and made only scattered appearances. Her final films were Skyjacked, 1972, and The Night God Screamed, 1975. Crane passed away within two months of her husband on December 14, 2003, from a heart attack. Today, the Jean Crane collection survives at Wesleyan University's Cinema Archives in Middletown, Connecticut, thanks to the work of 20th Century Fox publicist Charles J. Finley. The Pan Pacific Auditorium, where Jean was crowned Miss Pan Pacific, was included in the National Register of Historic Places, but was destroyed in a fire in 1989. It stood at 7600 Beverly Boulevard in Los Angeles. In 2002, the site was converted to Pan Pacific Park and has a recreation center, with a small replica of one of the initial auditorium's famous towers. Let's take a moment to remember Jean Crane. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.